Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we are with uh, someone that everyone considers a tennis innovator. Uh, he was a great tennis player himself, 1980 Australian Open champion, a Wimbledon singles quarter finalist, right? Final eight club yep. at the All Leaning Club. Uh, was number seven in the world in singles, number five in the world in doubles, eight career ATP titles, 16 doubles titles. He's got wins over players we know and love, Jimmy Connors, Arthur Ashe, Stan Smith, who was just on the show a few weeks ago, uh, Lindell, and been a coach to a lot of great players, Greg Rosetsky, Max Mirny, the Beast, uh, famous doubles teams, Richie Renneberg, uh, Mark Knowles, my colleague at Tennis Channel, and then the great Andre Agassi. Uh, his name is Brian Teacher. Brian, I want to welcome you to the show. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. So you look at all of your roles in tennis, right? And it's, it's, what's interesting about, you know, this show is everyone on this show that I interview is A, number one, a legend. Number two, an entrepreneur or an innovator in the sport. You know, you think about we had Stan Smith on a few weeks ago and how he you know, sort of revolutionized the shoe and got a shoe that has outlived his career. Um, and when you think about your playing career, 1980 Aussie Open champion, and now innovating tennis with a new app that we'll talk about later in the show to help coaches sort of connect with players, help players connect with high level coaches. Um, you know, just an innovator, I want to welcome to the show. Uh, and before we get into the app, I want to talk about a, the 1980 Australian Open. You know, I think that, you know, Grand Slam runs are magical and very hard to get. I mean, you think about a lot of players who've retired, great players who failed to win a Grand Slam, right? Or right. players who were no one in the world for years and then only won one, like it was Niaki, right? It took forever to win one. Or like a Halep, I think she, five Grand Slam finals before she eventually won one. Winning the title of the thing. Take us back to 1980, the Aussie Open Championship, uh, back when it was played at Kuyong, which is now a practice site for the Aussie Open. Tell me about right. that run, what happened? Because I feel like there's always something special that happens on a Grand Slam title run. They had an impact on, other than the tennis. Well, it was pretty, you know, it was a pretty interesting story. Not a lot of people know about it, but... Um, I was, uh, I'd, I'd been on a good run in Asia. I'd been in about, uh, I'd been four finals in Asia and I'd lost each one of the finals. I'd, I'd had Lendl, I was up a set and a break uh, and double break point for to serve for the match in, in Hong Kong <laughs> in the finals and I lost that. So I'd had a string of losses in the finals. Then I went to, uh, to Sydney and I got, I played really well. I got into the finals of Sydney, which is, you know, the warm up of the Aussie Open. And then I, I lost, like, uh, I think it was, an, I think at that time it was a nine point tiebreaker. I can't quite remember if it was nine or, or the, the bigger one. But anyway, I had match point against, and I lost to Fritz Buning in the finals. And he beat me in the finals. He had a great tournament. And at the time, you know, I was married, right? So I, I didn't have a few marital problems. And I called up my wife at that time and she said, I want a divorce. That was the first words out of her mouth. I want a divorce. And I said, what? What are you talking about? She was back, back in LA. And I said, oh my God. I said, I, I don't think I, you know, that's like so weird. I said, you know, oh my God, what's going on? And she said, well, we've got issues or whatever, whatever. We were having some problems obviously there. So I said, oh, I don't think I'm going to be able to, uh, play very well in the Australian Open, know that my wife wants a divorce or whatever. So I actually, I actually called the tournament director, Colin Stubbs, and I said, Colin, I was embarrassed to tell him I was having personal problems. And I said, Colin, I got to pull out of the event. I hurt my back. And so he says, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Brian. And he says, I, I, I'm sorry to hear that. So he pulled, he pulled me out of the event. I was out of the Australian Open. So I packed my bags and uh, I got ready to go. And I got a call from my father-in-law and he said, look, he said, he said, look, if you don't feel like playing, I can understand what the issues that are going on. Don't, don't play, go to Hawaii, take a break, but don't come home. It's not going to do you any good right now. That was my father. That was my father-in-law. I thought about it and I said, well, I got, I got my, my cabs on the way to pick me up. I, I got a cab ride to go to the airport to take the flight home. 
And so I said, oh my God, he's telling me not to come home. So I said, okay, so let me see what I can do. I said, I'm, I don't think I'm going to, he said, why don't you go to Hawaii? And I thought about it going to Hawaii. I said, well, I said, you know what, if I go to Hawaii, you know, and I'm there by myself, it'll be kind of depressing. I think, I think I go nuts. I don't think I'd have a very good time there. I said, I might as well try and just play the tournament. I'm playing well. Maybe I can try to play the tournament and see. So I call Colin Stubbs back. This is like two hours later. And I call him back and I said, Colin, I said, uh, you know, I, I, I had some back treatment up at King's Cross. I had a little acupuncture. My back's feeling good, pretty good now. I said, is there any way I can get back in the event? And he said, uh, he said, oh, Brian, he said, you know, I am sorry. He said, I gave your spot away, but he says, let me, let me look here. And uh, so he, he looks on the list. He says, well, he says, I think, I think this other guy might be pulling out. He says, you know, I really can't do this. He said, I can get in a lot of trouble. I said, yeah, I, I guess, I don't know. And he says, but you know what? He says, I'm going to put you in, but you can't breathe a word of this to anybody. <laughs> so he put me back in the event and this is the event I won, man. So I was out of the event at one time and, you know, this story can only be told like 40 years later, right? Uh, you uh, in trouble, right? You know, it's one of those you can't tell them for like five years. It's still too close. Ten years, you got to wait 20, 30 years to tell this story, right? Right, right. <laughs> so, you know, I had, a, I had a hard time focusing each round, but I was playing really well. And then kind of I got a little momentum and, you know, I got to the quarters and said, you know, Brian, you can do this. Why don't you, you know, let's keep going. I think you got a shot. You play well on grass. I think you can do this. And so, yeah, that was that was obviously my biggest win. And then when I came home after that biggest win, then it kind of all hit the fan. And then I personal my personal life kind of fell apart. Six months, I didn't really feel like playing. And then I got injured, and my father passed away. So it was a it was a brutal year after winning. It was you thought yeah sometimes running right your top, it just completely came tumbling down right after that for about a year. Yeah, I was about to say so. So now that you're famous and you're a Grand Slam champion, they didn't save it, huh? <laughs> that didn't save it no not at that time it got worse it got horrible when i came home man it was like not fun at all but that that's life man it happens right hey i always say I, uh me and my wife always joke we say life be life yeah. life just it just happens right it just happens man you got to deal with it right um so you got to seven world and you played in like an era that now you see tc running like video, the video is very blurry, right? Uh, the US Open Court is all green. This is before the blue right. and green. Right. Uh, you see Connors drumming up the crowd. You see Arthur Ashe, right? With his very diplomatic sort of fist pumps. You know what I mean? Tell us a story or two about playing in that era. What was, what was it like playing against Connors who would do anything to win, whether it's in the gamesmanship, the sportsmanship. And conversely, tell us what it was like to play against Arthur who was, the ultimate diplomat. Well, our Arthur was, you know, I was kind of in the thick of it with, with, you know, like Connors and McEnroe as far as the age group. So, I mean, Connor Connors was like, oh, I mean, he was an incredible, just an incredible competitor. I mean, you know, I love practicing. We practice a lot in, in, in LA and I love practicing with him. And you, you know, I learned a lot just being around him and practicing with him and how to compete, you know, and how to practice hard every point, you know, I, I don't think that I, you know, of any of the guys, I don't think anybody competed in practice as hard as Jimmy. I mean, he, you know, he didn't play that much. Like he, he wouldn't play four or five hours. He might just play two to three hours and that's it. But he was, he was like 110% in every time he got on the court. I mean, he just, like, he did not want to lose and he threw it all at the, you know, and he didn't really want to drill. He didn't like to drill. He didn't like, you know, he's just like, okay, let's warm up and play. Let's go. <laughs> you know? And he was like, that. you know, he was feisty, you know, and you got to, I admired the guy, you know, he's a feisty guy and, you know, McEnroe is feisty too. So we had a lot of interesting personalities, right? Very feisty, very feisty. You don't have those type of, well, you had a curious a little bit today, right? But he's not quite as good as those guys in a sense. And, uh, you know, and then you had guys like Arthur who were, you know, and Bjorn who were very low keyed and just kind of had that, you know, tennis, you know, traditional respect and good attitude and sportsmanship. Right. And, uh, you know, Connors and, uh, and they were fun to play against. And Nastasi was also a big character on the court. I mean, he was, oh, a, man. he was a huge character. I mean, he'd stop play, you know, when you could, you know, he'd be playing at Wimbledon and, you know, he, he'd be losing. And next thing you know, you know, 15 minutes later, he'd be still arguing, you know, they didn't have quite the rules at that game to like control the guys, you know, as much as they do today. So those rules were, were good that they were brought up because of that era and because of those stars were able to control the play and control sometimes when they'd win or lose, just because they'd say, you know what, 
this guy's beating me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm going to stall this, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to throw, throw them off. Right. You know, and they really would. Right. And they, yeah. and they, and they got away with it and for a time, they can't get away with it anymore. So, you know, I think it was very colorful. It was a very colorful because we had so many, you know, and Ivan was such a great competitor as well. He was, he was an incredibly tough competitor and, but there's so many different types of attitudes. He was more the stoic, super serious, dry sense of humor guy, you know, and then nasty is kind of like you know the carefree kind of wild guy, and then you got these competitors with Connors and uh, you know and McEnroe that were just so fiery out there. It was like people just you know they used to love to come to McEnroe and just root against him basically. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so it was just it was kind of a it was a we didn't have the amount of TV coverage and the amount of crowds, but it was it was still pretty pretty insane time for tennis i mean you know compared to today i mean obviously the technology and the prize money's gotten better and the technology's advanced and with that everybody's gotten a little different styles of play right we were all grew up on wood rackets when i won the australian open i transitioned right that year to uh to the first uh, mid-sized graphite racket which was kennex so you know the mm. the synthetic rackets weren't quite they were just start coming out when i won the australian open just barely right yeah when you think about sort of the competitive era. I think that the Connors, McEnroe, Borg era, your era was like on a different level as it relates to competitiveness. I think this generation, obviously when you think about like some of the battles Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic have had, those are always top levels of just pure competitiveness. And I think besides that, it kind of falls off. And I think this past U.S. Open, so U.S. Open 2022, I think it started to raise its level back. You saw Alcaraz play three or four or five set matches in a row against right. like center, TFO, TFO played Nadal. I thought right. that that year's U.S. Open in that half of a draw was probably the most, you know, when you think about obviously the tactics and that kind of stuff, if you throw all that aside and you just saw raw, Mono mono competition, no everyone trying to hold on as long as they can, not back down. That was sort of the wave that I think we need to get back to. Because I mean, let's face it, right? The past couple of years we kept saying, you know, players now make so much money, they can take it or leave it, right? The losses, you know, they're they're a little bit detached from the result, blah, blah, blah. But this year's US Open showed a deep attachment to the result. Well, how'd you feel? I, th I think what's happened is, you know, we had the COVID, which was a tough period for, t for tennis and for any sports, right? And so it kind of dropped off with some people not getting vaccinated, da, da, da. Some people, you know, the tournaments reduced schedules and all this stuff. But I think you've also seen that now the rest of the group sees that the end of the career is coming for these three top guys, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so with the end of that, they're saying, you know what? there's room here. I want to step up. I want to step up. I want to see what I can do. I can't, you know, maybe I'm not like those guys, but you know, I can do well. And they're starting to believe in themselves more. <laughs> These three guys are kind of like at the end of the career. They, I mean, they dominated so much. I mean, nobody felt like they had a chance. If right. it wasn't one, it was the other, you know? And so, you know, kind of the era that I played. So you had guys winning, you know, like, you know, seven majors, right. But not like, you know, not like 15, 14, 20, right. Yeah, I mean, it was just crazy. These guys are so dominant. I mean, we've never seen in tennis, three guys so dominant as we've had, which is incredible. So, so I think with kind of the end of their careers that we see like more guys starting to own it, basically saying, yeah, I, I can do this. And so, like you said, in the last U S open, we saw, we saw a pretty high level there, which was, which was exciting to see. Right. Yeah. So you talk about like one of the things I, you stuck with me, you said Jimmy Connors and the way he practiced, right? Cause you know, obviously, you know, we coach players at a high level. And I would say that when you think about some of the younger players, right. Um, players who are just entering the tour and you look at them and say, okay, this player is talented and is a great player, top 10 in the world in the juniors, but they still don't know how to practice. Right. You had a chance to work with some great players, right? So you think about Greg Ruzetsky, the Beast, Max Mirny, Agassi, Mark Knowles, Nosey, right? And Richie Renneberg. Tell me about, and this sort of, I think, leads into your desire to have an app that can connect players and coaches, you know, help improve players, help them teach them how to practice. Tell me about that experience of being a coach, because those are big names who all had great runs. What, how did you impact those players from a practice standpoint 
and coaching standpoint that clearly well, had they're, they're all a little different depends upon where they were with their with their games and you know and what was going on i mean R rosetsky kind of been on the tour you know for five years and it had been a little bit up and down and was kind of down when i got him and he you know he just had a lot of holes in his game i mean he had a lot of uh, a lot of weaknesses that guys were picking on he had a, he had an awesome serve and uh kind of a, a big forehand that you didn't weren't sure if it was going to go in or out basically and then his backhand he couldn't really hit over it you know mm -hmm. at all and he could just chip it so you know and then his volleys weren't weren't all that competent at the time it was kind of I'll tell you a funny story when I was the first time I I got with Greg is like we, we were at St. Poulton and uh it was a clay court, right? It was before the French Open or whatever it was in Austria. So I'm, I'm watching him play and, you know, and I'm working with him and I'm trying to understand. And so he's got this huge lefty serve and he's serving and he's coming in. And if the ball is not quite right in his like strike zone for his volleys, yeah. he'll just, he just won't even go for it. He'll just yeah. let it go. Like, it's like he, he won't try for it. And it's like, Greg, you can get that ball. Don't you realize that? You got to work for it and get it, right? So he just had become so kind of used to hitting such a big serve and getting a weak point that if it was anything to work hard for, that he just he just didn't do it. And so, you know, and so you got to start with the work. Okay, if you want to be good, you got to go after every point and not give anything away. And he had such a big serve and a big forehand that if, you know, we started to get him so he could hit over the backhand a little bit and be very confident with his volleys and, and, and be able to rally a little bit in the backcourt and then chip and come in. And so we just kind of, kind of took away the, the glaring holes and made him solid. And with the rest of his game, he had big weapons with the forehand, the serve, and he volleyed well, and he had a great chip and he could come over the backhand a little bit, pass, pass with it, not, he couldn't come over it consistently hard, but he would, he could definitely use it to pass. And he did. And as soon as he did that, he, he started doing well on the tour, basically. Mm -hmm. The other guys were different They you know, like uh, Max was already on the tour, you know, and I worked with these guys. I, I think I worked with like uh, uh, Knowles, Nestor, Grab, Renenberg, uh, Gary Moeller, Rostagno was a top 10 player. You know, it's all just kind of, managing and helping them out daily you know just what they were doing wrong and watching them play but nobody had his structural issues like like greg had with his game greg mm -hmm. had a big issue with his return to serve and the hopping and stuff but you know working with these guys and seeing you know most of the time the top guys don't have structural things but even rosetsky who he did have structural things and so even like an app like i like i built today could help him out greatly when when we're on the court working that i could show him exactly what he's doing when we're away so i hope it's okay i'll set i'll segue into the talking about the app and how it can help is that so part of part of me in coaching is sees that a lot of kids that basically that come to me you know, I don't coach full time anymore, but even I coach occasionally. But the kids that come to me that I see are age anywhere from 13 to 16. Most of them have glaring technical issues with their game, meaning that they can play at a pretty high level, but they're not going to they're, they're going to hit a wall where they can't go any further because of the, their technique. All right. And so that's kind of disturbing to me that the parents uh, and kids, the parents spend all this money for their kids to get lessons and the kids practice hard and that they're not able to go any further because they, they've learned faulty technique. That shouldn't happen in this day and age of technology. And what can we do to help that? And so part of that reason was that I built this app. And so, you know, in the app, you can take video, right? And you can scroll it back and forth and you can see, show the person exactly what he's doing, right? And you can compare it next to another pro side by side with the same angle. And you can show them. So the, the, the reality is that, that, you know, different styles of play. Pros have different styles of play. But if you look at 10 pros, okay, let's say you look at 10 pros with a platform serve. You look at 10 top servers. You know, take 10 good servers out of the top 100. You look at their serve, and you're going to see mechanic, biomechanically that they, they have a little different style, everyone, but they basically have certain ingredients that are the same. So we need to at least understand those ingredients and those ingredients need to be able to pass on to coaches what to teach and coach. And they don't do. And I'll tell you what, I was just down at the Indian Wells and I'm looking at the girls 
top girls playing, girls seated, you know, seated players and top juniors that are one and two in the world. And their technique in the serve is just so flawed. It's crazy. It's crazy mm -hmm. what they're teaching. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, they're pin, they're, uh, uh, pinpoint serve, bringing the foot up, loading the arm straight up here, no shoulder turn, no rotation whatsoever. And how many girls serve like that? A ton, a ton. Mm -hmm. And some of them, because they're six one, they get away with it, right? But they're losing out and they're losing a lot of money on the kid. It shouldn't be that way today, really, with technology. So that's why I kind of built this app. And so there's three ways you can help a player today with the app. Now, now you can take a whole match with the app. You can literally put the app behind the quarter, put it up, and you can take a whole match. And it drops into this special format that makes it really unique for viewing. And what is that? It is so let's say. Let's say uh, you have a match and you're videotaping a match and you see somebody, the opponent is serving to you. So when he's serving and basically, so you can see your split step in relation to the serve, right? And so you can track the ball and you can see how much, when did, when did the returner start his split step? Is he in balance? Look at the ball now. The ball, here's the ball. We see it. It's right at the service line. It's right at the, it's right at the net. Did he make his split step? Is he in balance? If a guy's hitting 120, 130 mile an hour serve, if he's not in balance when that ball crosses the net, he's done. He, he's done. And then what is his first move? Is he have a nice unit turn or pivot? So many guys still return serve, not that well. And for instance, I'm watching the kid. Um, uh, what's the kid says? Shelton, right? He doesn't have a good... Yeah, he doesn't have a, you know, no one showed him how to return serve basically on the first serve. He's, he's off balance in the whole thing. It's a simple fix, but somebody needs to show him what he's doing basically. And so this is a perfect thing. So you can load a whole match now. You can load them. If you have, if you have, you can take a match with the, with, with the app or you can load a whole match uh, from the website. You can load it from your computer, from Dropbox or from Google Drive, and then you can play it, you know, on our, on our, on our media player, which you can zoom in, you can zoom in on the action, you can zoom out, you can scroll it back and forth, you can see the stroke, you can see all the action points, all the balance points, all the pivot points, anything you want. So much more information than you can get out of traditional viewing. If there, there's nothing, there's nothing out there like it right now. And then for the listeners, give us the name of the app. Full court tennis, full court tennis. Right now it's only on iOS. So here's the other thing. So you asked about remote. So, you know, you're with, you know, a lot of times coaches have, you know, they don't travel every week. Sometimes they have an assistant coach or a second coach to coach. So for instance, we, in the app now, you can have a lesson space where you can invite in multiple users. So on the app right now, I have a lesson space that I have, I've invited Bryce Nakashima. He's Brandon's brother. He's going on scholarship to Ohio State next year, right? So he's in the lesson space. Uh, Dominic Herbati, who basically, you know, is 12 in the world. So he's in there. Brandon's mother, uh, and Bryce's mother, Christina, is in there. Chris, Chris yes. As, along as with uh, Jaime, who is Brandon's hitting partner. So we have five people in the lesson space. Now we take video and we share it back and forth. Dominique's in, in Florida. I'm in L.A. Bryce is in in San Diego, and we analyze it and we give feedback and we give different opinion, you know, we give similar and different opinions. So he gets feedback. You know, sometimes you can communicate something, but one person says it a little different way. And so it's that little different nuance that that person says it clicks in your mind. So we have all this information that we send the video, we can analyze it, send it back. And we got the parent in there, which is really important because it's always important for the parent. It's like the, that triangle from the coach, player, parent, right? That needs to be solidified so that the parent knows what the coach is actually working on and, and likes what they're working on, right? A lot of times they drop the kid off and they don't really see what the kid's doing. This way they can kind of monitor what the kid is supposed to be doing and you can see the progress back and forth. So in this multiple lesson space, you can basically look, you could load a whole match in there if you want, or you can just analyze certain parts of it or certain uh, stroke clips. And we're able to actually show position, you know, okay, that ball's coming here. You can see across in the net, you're not in position. You needed to take that ball earlier. You can see basically the distance and where that is. So this is great information that the person has to practice. You know, a lot of it's positioning, sometimes it's strokes. 
But any type of information that you need to coach, you can basically see it in this system, which is which you cannot see in traditional viewing. So let me ask you this, though, because, you know, there's people out who tag matches. So if you load an entire match into this app and you're providing feedback on something a player does at 2245, right? How do you provide feedback on this next point? Right. Okay, so that yeah. player. So, can... so, yeah. So what you do is you can actually just take that point and you can just annotate it right there. You're talking about this point. Okay. Here's a 224. And now I'm drawing on it and I'm showing you exactly what you're doing. I move it back and forth. I'm voicing over and I, and I'm done and it encodes and you can send it right to the person and show them exactly what they're doing right there. Really cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that I think, you know, the, the where this app could fit in is you've got, you know, pro coaches who have academies at home, right? And who've got a base of kids who they probably have had for years prior to them getting a player. Um, and so a way for perhaps coach in touch with their home, right? Also have a, an assistant coach picks up their lessons when they're gone. You've got a pro who might live in Spain, but the coach lives in California, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Or vice versa. And so it creates these open lines. And then you've got the parent, right? Because, you know, the, we, we've got this term we say in tennis, the momager, right? The, the right. mom manager, right? Who, who is really probably the most important person in the pro coach agent career kind of triangle is the parent, right? The most irremovable person in the middle. Yeah, can sabotage exactly. The whole, yeah, sabotage the whole thing. Or be the glue that keeps it together, and that's how this and that and that's how this satisfies that equation that you're you're showing them and you're showing them what you're doing, and they're all in the same space together with coaches. You can have coaches from around the world, and you can be sending the video remotely, and they can be giving you feedback. Hey, you're at this tournament, and here's a problem with my game. What do you think, coach, or whatever? I'm with the assistant coach, or here's my parent here sending you video. So it mm -hmm. solves a lot, and the, the ability to, to load the whole match on there is 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 a huge thing too. Because now, just what you're saying, you know, you can see at certain part of the part of the match if there's an issue. Well, you can just record that portion of the match and say, okay, I'm gonna record, I'm gonna I'm gonna annotate it like a four minute clip right here of that point, and I'm gonna send you this is what's going on, and you're gonna see it in two seconds basically. So you can do it from anywhere on the planet. Yeah. So. Right now, how much is it? Is it app free? Is it subscription based? Yes. Is it a cost per team, cost per user? Right now, it's free. I'm just trying to get adoption. I'm just trying to get adoption. You know, so yeah. we're eating up some costs. So, I mean, eventually it'll be, you know, when there's a lot of data being used, you know, like maybe a coach will be like $4.99 a month or something like that. But right mm -hmm. now, it's free. We're just trying to get adoption. And, uh, and so, we're, we're happy to just to put it out there. It's definitely not going to be expensive or whatever, but we want, we want people to see the validity to what we're doing, because I think it's, I think it's huge. I mean, I, I was a pro player and a, and a pro coach, you know, and so even as a play, kid growing up, if I had some technology like this, that's today, I'd be, I'd be, you know, using that at the park every day, trying to figure out my game and you know, and we have a pro library. You don't have to use our pro library. Go get your own videos. There's a zillion ways. You know, I don't have to tell people how to go get videos of top pros. They can figure it out and compare <laughs> their pro and strokes. I mean, but, you know, it, the bottom line is, so the strokes, it's funny. I work on the court with kids and I take the video and show them their strokes, right? And you can compare it and get back to work in two seconds. So you can use it on the court. You can you can review it, you know, with a match that they send you or load on the system. And you can like you like I just said, you can you can actually annotate points and give it back to them. Or you can go on a live video call with them and go over the whole match on the app. You can, you know, so coach basically, you know, I'm talking about just everything right now that it's just, you know, it'll be subscription, but you actually can make money on the app. You can set your rates, you can determine whatever rates you want. You can set your schedule, your availability. You can get hired on the app. You want a, you want an hour uh, video consult with me to go over your match or an hour and a half or whatever? Schedule it here. Here's my rates. So it's up to the coach. The coach can choose to do it free with anybody or he can or he can use his rates and just say, hire me. It's up to the coach if he wants to do something free. Well, let me talk to, so you talk about the pro library, right? So you've obviously gone through and picked out the pros that you believe have great fundamentals, right? Fundamentals that should be 
duplicated, emulated, and followed. Uh, and I think the reason why that's important is because you and I talked about, you know, I look at the tour and I look at we talk about the things that a lot of players can't do is sometimes we, we, we don't draw a clear line between style and fundamentals, right? So you see people have like a style like Federer or Roddick has a, a very unique style, but the fundamentals are all the same, shoulder over shoulder, uh, contact point, um, acceleration, jumping up into the ball, all those kinds of things that are fundamentals mixed into a very different style is where I think we sort of, in this country, get a little confused because whoever's, whoever's the flair, you know, like if you look at Francis TFO's forehand, stylistically, it's probably a little odd, right? But I think now he's figured out his fundamentals and his timing to make at least contact point and what's, what's happening within, you know, two to four feet away from the contact point more fundamentally sound, even though stylistically, it might look a little strange. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're talking about one of the one of the best athletes that's probably ever played the game, and, yeah. and he's got. I wouldn't say he's fundamentally, you know, got the soundest, you know, strokes, but you know, the guy's an unbelievable athlete, an unbelievable competitor, and I wouldn't necessarily model anybody's strokes after after Francis. You know, he's got his own style. And it would be hard to teach somebody Roddick's exact serve, right? That worked for him. It's not, those are like kind of the one-offs, right? Those right. are the, kind of the one-offs. You know, they work for that guy. Would they work for somebody else? Well, I don't know. But let's, you know, if we got 10 people that are the same, let's try to work with the 10 top players that look kind of the same, right? You know, that's the, that's the type of thing. So so what? tell us some of the players that are in your pro, pro library that uh, you think have great well, sort of base fundamentals. We look. We have a we we have a limited library. Okay, I'll tell you exactly who's in it, and and it's not easy to get these libraries. So basically, you know, you got to go to the player, you got to go to the agent, right, right. and you got to go to their lawyer. Right. So nothing is easy, right? So so I've struggled to get ten, and I'm working on the technology. But I've got like Taylor Fritz, Jerome, uh, Zavida. Steve Johnson, uh, Gerald Donaldson, Nakashima, Russ. So then I got a 40, oh, 40 over player, Michael Russell, 50 over players, Brad Gilbert, Creek, Chuck Adams, Mark Knowles. And why do I have an over 50 player? Because if you're over 50 and you're trying to play the game, you, you don't, you shouldn't be modeling your game after Nadal or Federer or whatever you need. You need a more conservative style. Otherwise you're going to hurt yourself. Right. Right. And right. so, and so there should be different models for different ages, basically. So those are the models I have. I'd love to get some women going, but like I said, I've, I've been so involved in just getting more tech on there that I haven't been in the process of going to players and agents and trying to get more players on, you know, more pro players on the app because you can figure out a way to do it. I'm giving you samples, but it sh you should, the person should be creative enough to figure out how do I get pro players onto the app? And, and you have a camera. All I can say is you have a camera in the app. You, you're supposed to own the, the, uh, the video rights, you know, of the images you take. But you, as we know, people take video right, vi videos and they use them for their own personal use, Right. So if you want to use something for your own personal use, that's totally your privacy and what you want to do, right? Well, let me ask this question. So the biggest base in tennis is the club player, right? The 3.5 woman that's playing on a club league, traveling team, et cetera, et cetera. Where, where does this at best fit them? Because in my mind, I'm thinking, we talk about no, we talk about Mike Russell. Like if I'm in that demographic, that age group, I'm looking at those guys with very kind of classic strokes, not a lot of wrist, not a lot of arm turnover, um, maybe not a lot of racket head speed, more linear kind of strokes. Uh, how does this help that player easily find a player that they should be emulating well, versus going in and trying to hit B knocks backhand? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, th I think they just go on the app and they try to compare to the over 50 crowd or whatever, the, the players on there, you know, like the, uh, like, like I said, like Gilbert Creek, who have more classic uh, yeah. strokes, right? They don't, they don't get it. They don't get as much, they don't have as much flexibility or torque. They don't have the fast, quick, the fast twitch muscles, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's just a way more conservative shot, right? And so those three, three, oh, to three, five players, basically, 
that's basically who they should be emulating more like the conservative approach let's just figure out how to make contact and how to get through the ball we don't need to be you know flipping over the ball and doing the windshield so much right let's just right. figure out how to make contact get through and just get better consistent right because yeah. like those guys you know those guys did it pretty well to, to say the least right so it's like you know they make contact they get through the ball and and if any player can just follow this pretty, it's a lot simpler, right? And a lot more basic, right? And so that's what those players should be working on. And, and you know, they can they can get on the app and there's a feed, a full court feed on the app where they can follow the coaches, they can follow their posts. You know, there's like, there's like 15 channels that you can post on with the app. We've got, you know, analysis, tips, drills, mental training, physical training, uh, you know, the different strokes that people post on there. So there's all kinds of different channels and you can look for your level of play. So if you're an intermediate player, you can look for intermediate posts, right? Mm. Or yeah. if you're a beginner, you can look for beginning posts. So it's it's all broken out for you. So I'd be remiss if I didn't go back and ask you about, uh, we talk about, we're talking about how to practice. Uh, people with great practice have as great strokes. Um, I had a chance to sort of be around Max Mirny and just observe his professionalism. He had a good relationship with one of my good friends, uh, Othman Garma. And during his last couple of years on tour, and this is the guy that displayed, this is when he was solely playing dubs, right? And you think, well, he's playing half the court. I mean, the guy was in the gym, his preparation, his practice, just his, his cool down, everything was so solid, so professional. You would think he was getting ready to play Djokovic, even though he's playing the first round of you know, a doubles match or whatever. Yeah. It was just like, tell me what it was like being around him because when I think about sort of the model professional, right? Um, he's that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he is he is a true professional. I mean, he worked hard at his craft. You know, he he started off. You know, I I remember when he was a young kid. You know, he had a long ways to go of working hard and improving, and he just he did everything he could in his power to to get better. And he slowly he slowly did. And even like just what you said, he he you know he did his exercises, his stretching, his flexibility, and he took the the warm up, the cool down. You know, the, all the preparation, the practice. He took it all seriously like a professional. And that's you know I I think today that. I mean, I really think that all the guys have to. I mean, you know, if you look on the tour today, I mean, I mean, the men's tour anyway. Uh, I mean, they, I mean, a good portion of these guys have, you know, have physical trainers as well as coaches traveling with them. You know, it's it's like serious business, you know. And so you you don't want to give anything away. So these guys are, you know, these guys are pretty serious about their professionalism today. <laughs> yeah. So before I let you go, I want to thank you for for, for being with us, and I want you to. Give us, I mean, you know, this is a free tool, right? There's not a lot of free tools in tennis. No. You know, in today's age, we yeah. found a way to sort of monetize everything and commoditize everything. So, so give us the app again, remind us where we can find it so that, you know, we can get some more players to, you know, adopt it, connect with high level coaches sure. who might be leaders on the app right now, like a Mike Russell, like a Noli, whoever else. Yeah, well, we, you know, we feature ATP and WTA coaches in the app. So a lot of those coaches are already on the app, but, uh, but it's full court tennis and just, you get it at the app store, full court tennis. We're only at, on Apple right now, uh, full court tennis. And if you have any issues or problems, you can always email me bt at fullcourttennis.com. This is my yeah. initial bt at fullcourttennis.com. Well, I want to thank you. Um, you know, the sport continues to need people like you who, uh, reach back on their experience and try to move the game forward. Um, because I say in this sport, you know, as great of a sport it is, as global as it is, you know, we're still behind basketball, baseball, American football, in terms of popularity in terms of, you know, monetization, et cetera. So all these things that you're doing uh, and all the things that all the other entrepreneurs are doing who were former tennis players trying to kind of move the ball forward, if you will, uh, are very valuable. So I want to thank you for, number one, your commitment to the game, and then, you know, what you do on a daily basis. Hey, thank this, you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been the Tennis.com podcast with 1980 Australian Open champion, Ryan Teacher, coach, mentor to many, and uh, creator of the Full Court Tennis app. Thanks for joining